This week on Gravel, we've got double dichotomous questions. They're delicious. And we've also got a discussion on dumb dogs. And then we're missing a D, but the trapping in California. We're not so good with alliteration or verbs or nouns or conjugating, but we're on gravel. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Well, somehow you have turned off the interstate onto a secondary road, and then probably you took that right up there. You uh, hit that that little county road that the pavement stopped, and then you found yourself on gravel. That's where you are now. This is On Gravel. I'm Andrew McKeon talking to you from Glasgow, Montana. Ryan Bronson in Egan, Minnesota. And Eric Dinger, Lincoln, Nebraska, America. What are we talking about today, McKean? We got a bunch of things on tap. We're going to talk just a little bit about kind of some breaking news out of California. Uh, Trapping has been in decline for 180 years, and now it may have really taken a dive in California. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, We can't leave the conversation without talking dogs. I have to tell you about the dumbassest thing that my dog Nellie has ever done this weekend and then we want to maybe uh suggest that your dog might be a good dog ambassador i think we're going to talk a little bit about the stuff that you keep and the stuff that you give and we have a dichotomous question to to discuss so with that all right i'm just going to get this out of the way (laughs) because last last episode we talked a little bit about the proudest but also the maddest we've been at our dogs and um this weekend i had one on the the bad side of that spectrum we were i was out ice fishing on fort peck reservoir and it's it's a it's gigantic body of water one of the bigger reservoirs on the northern plains the ice conditions have been a little sketchy this year because we've had so much snow um drilling down through the ice we're actually fishing for lake trout off the face of the dam so i mean we're standing over probably 210 feet of water um not a ton of ice for as cold as it's been maybe eight nine inches of ice but it's kind of a little sketchy well, we're not too far out from, this is a big bottom draw reservoir. So um, the water comes out of the lake, it goes through these shaft houses, down through a tunnel into the turbines that are down below. There's probably a good deal of kind of whirlpool effect on the surface. So there's a place out in front of the dam, even on the coldest winters like this one, it just doesn't ice up. And we were fishing maybe 350 yards away from some open water. There was a big old seagull sitting on that water. And I I could kind of see Nellie notice that seagull as we tromped out there and started fishing, but it was so far away she didn't pay any attention. Well, I mean, she's a classic two-year-old. She just gets bored easy. We weren't catching a lot of fish. Uh, we put the Frisbee away for a little bit. And she, I could see her just lock eyes on that seagull, and she's standing by me just trembling, waiting for the command to go. I wasn't going to give it to her. In fact, a couple times I said, no, Nellie, don't do it. She knew exactly what I was talking about. I turned to talk to somebody, turned away from Nellie, and she took that as her cue to go get that seagull. So she covers 300 yards of ice in about 12.6 seconds. The seagull sees her coming. At this point, we're all watching. There's probably 10 of us sitting around there. Well, Nellie has got so much ahead of steam, she can't stop. And she just plows into that open water. Oh, no. Well, the open water is surrounded by, you know, it's probably maybe half an acre of open water. She's surrounded by ledge ice everywhere. Yeah. And I, I have enough confidence in Nellie's athleticism that I knew she was going to get out. But after two or three attempts of her getting her front paws up on the ice, and you can see her kind of scrabbling her back legs to try to get up, she was not getting up. So she started swimming circles around that open water. And I was like, oh, no. Time for a rescue. And, you know, my old dog Willow, who actually ended up drowning, that's how she died. Uh, I would have, you know, I would have done anything to the ends of the earth to save her. Nellie? I actually kind of thought for a second. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah, I hate to say it. So, uh, but we had an ice fishing sled, so I started unloading it to take out there, see how close I could get to the the edge of the open water. I, I mean, I'm thinking as you do this, like, how am I, am I going to throw her a tow rope? Am I, am I going to get, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I'd only made it about 20 yards when all of a sudden she launches out of the ice and comes romping back to me, just frozen as a dipped candle, just layers of ice all over her. 
fact, when she ran by me, because she knew she was in trouble, she clattered like, you know, like Christmas ornaments. <laughs> oh, my goodness. God, what a dumbass. Yeah. Well, did she jump up on you at some point and get you all wet? Because my experience with Labradors is after they've done something like that, they want to share their experience with you. <laughs> or no. or did she know because you were recording a podcast out on the ice that she didn't <laughs> couldn't get that expensive uh, gear gear wet? Yeah, yeah, we we know you were cheating on us, McKean. We know. Yeah, true story. I was uh, I I was I was talking to others. Is it <laughs> kind of you, sounds euphemistic? <laughs> um, so there's two part question there. The first thing she did is actually she just rolled in the snow all the way back. You know, I think she had. Yeah a lot of icicles stuck to her. She was trying to break them off and and then kind of dry off too. But yeah, so we started recording the podcast soon after that and then she couldn't leave us alone. She just wanted to rub up against us the entire time. Uh, I don't know when it'll be on, but this was the Hunting Collective podcast with Ben O'Brien. The Meat Eater crew was up to uh, see where I live, talk about some all kinds of stuff. And then we I took him ice fishing. We had never caught a fish, by the way. But we had a lot. We had a good time. About lost my dog. Now, did I see some old Milwaukee's? Oh, <laughs> some old Milwaukee's. So, you know, I don't know how it is. This town of Glasgow, Montana, runs on old Milwaukee. It's the the fuel that keeps us going. But it's not. It's old Milwaukee light in the blue can. Well, well you don't want to be. You don't want to. You know, put extra pounds on while you're no. feeding your alcoholism. <laughs> so. They have a new series. It's the American Pinup Girl series. So there's you know, all these seductive. Uh, looks like your grandma in her high school uh, formal dance picture. Well, my grandma wore more more clothes than some of these, but you know it's kind of classic. You can have your little pinup girl on your beer can. Of course, we had pounders, so it takes a while to get through them. I would have been a more successful drinker if it hadn't been so cold. About halfway through my beer, they just iced up. Oh, my gosh. You know, remind us, uh, Andrew, uh, remind us if we ever come see you to bring our own alcohol, okay? <laughs> Maybe a koozie. <laughs> yeah. And a, a koozie. thermos yeah. <laughs> to heat it up. It's not to keep, you, it's not to keep your beer cold, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, to, <laughs> it's to keep the cold out. Mm-hmm. Well, the whole pinup girl thing makes me think of a potential giveaway we could do. I have got a T-shirt uh, that the John O'Dell from Arizona Game and Fish had sent me. It's from the Yuma Dove Classic. Every year on the opening of dove hunting in Yuma, Arizona, they have this big town festival, and uh, the big sporting goods retailer in town, Sprags, hosts it, and Federal Premium Ammunition sponsors it. And this year. They sent me one of the T-shirts from the event, and it features a 1940s World War II era pinup girl on the T-shirt, and I think she's a straddle a bomb, uh, like like a what would come out of a B-17, and it says the blank annual large breast competition, and it's not what you think. Uh, it's in town in in Yuma. It's a big vegetable producing city. Back in the 40s, when they were sending over uh, vegetables to Europe to the soldiers that were fighting World War II, they would include artwork on every crate that they shipped out, and it would have a pinup girl on it uh, painted on there. But the that so that's where the whole pinup art thing comes from and ties in with Yuma. But the large breast competition that they have is the biggest morning dove that anyone shoots. Uh, they weigh them, and you win a prize if you if your if your dove is bigger than everyone else's, and and so that's that's where the uh, the name comes from. But I I uh, I received it at home. I showed my wife. She was offended. I took it to wor- work. I showed it to some of the folks at work, and they were they were offended. So I thought I'm not going to be able to wear this in public in all likelihood because it takes too long to explain what the what the background is, like I just did on the podcast. So maybe we should, it's brand new, uh, maybe we should give it away, you know, for our next giveaway here for the podcast. I feel like that that's a very fitting giveaway for On Gravel, a used t-shirt. That's great. It's not used, it's never been worn. Oh, you didn't wear it? Oh. No, I've never worn it. Oh, okay. 
But, I mean, if he, if you think it would add to the value, I mean, these game-worn hockey jerseys people pay more for, I could wear it if people want, if that would make it more valuable to them. I think if you pit out once in it, it probably adds to the value. Okay. All right. <laughs> By the way, your story, Bronson, reminded me that our listener um, really values when, when Andrew says the word boobies. And I think because this is a breast competition, Andrew, you, I think it's permission to say that word for our listener. You know, people have to have standards and believe in something. And I refuse to be kind of a parlor game where somebody just brings out the term booby and expects me to say it. I'm better than that. Good on you. Well played. (laughs) So to continue with the dog theme, uh, I think we will put on the Facebook page this call for dog ambassadors. The uh, outdoor brand Merrill uh, is looking for a dog to be the face of the brand. I know Nellie can never do it. Why couldn't Nellie do it? Because she'd do something appalling, (laughs) uh, just as the eyes of America were on her. She's at the photo shoot just mowing down the other dog poop. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I'm just going to take her out of contention right away. Hey, you you guys see that seagull over there? You see that seagull? (laughs) (laughs) Bet Bet I can catch that seagull. So this is actually... I don't want this to all be about sort of Nellie malfeasance, but one of the things that I have to manage with her a little bit is, um, is she, she'll still sort of pee at inappropriate times. And it's, uh, when she gets just nervous or she feels guilty about something, one of the ways she expresses it, she just, it's just a urine, just a bladder dump, no matter where she is, including in the house. And so we had these guests come up. I mentioned the media crew. They stayed with us, uh, Friday night. The boys got home from, uh, school and, and, and track practice, and they uh, saw we had a bunch of new friends in there, and Nellie was all excited to meet him and opened the door, and Nellie just <laughs> took one look and just, like, just lost it, just just peed all over the kitchen. So she would clearly do that in any photo studio in America and probably electrocute everybody. Well, I, I, I saw a uh, – it was a guy, it wasn't a gal, do the exact same thing when they saw Ben O'Brien here – in Las Vegas uh, last month, so it's he has that effect on people. You think it's been? Oh, maybe it is yeah, been. been. Hey, uh, dichotomous question from my daughter uh, Reagan, who is seven this morning. If you if you had to pick into your office right now came one horse sized bee. Or one thousand B-sized horses. Which one would you prefer? Oh, a thousand little horses. Mm-hmm, me too. Yeah, I agree with that. She said the bee. Well, is it a bumblebee or a honeybee? I don't know. Just a bee. Okay. I mean, just think about it. That gigantic bee would be terrifying. It would be. Yeah. But a thousand little horses is <laughs> cool. <laughs> no word if they could fly. <laughs> I mean, so what I'm picturing in my mind's eye is stepping on them like bugs and then being, oh, whoops, sorry, but they're going to be underfoot everywhere. You're going to mm-hmm. step on them. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And Nellie's going to be eating them. Oh. Uh, and... Yeah. Just... <laughs> <laughs> hey, McKean, if and I'm going to ask you both this, but I'll give you time to think about it. So before the end of the podcast, if your dog was a well-known person, who would it be? Don't answer now. I'll give you time to think about it. We can go on to our topics at hand, but... As you were describing Nellie, I was thinking, Nellie's like, I think we need like a persona for Nellie. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. All right. I'll think on it a little bit. All right. Bit. Let's talk trapping. Uh, let's talk trapping. So one of the things that came across the wire here this past week is a bill in California, the source of nothing good when it comes to wildlife management, um, that would ban trapping ban licensed trapping in the state. A couple of the sources for this is there's a San Jose Mercury News piece and then a Los Angeles Times piece, and I think the Sacramento Bee has also covered it. Um, So I'm I'm eager to know more about it. So at least the popular press is reporting that there's been a lot of, obviously, uh, cultural opposition to it as California um, urbanizes and really changes uh, politically. 
But the other part is sort of a public policy choice that um, trapping no longer pays for itself. In fact, it's a huge net drain on on resources. The number of licensed trappers don't come anywhere close to covering the cost of, of administering the trapping program. Um, Bronson, initial thoughts about this? Well, I think you know this is it's part of the all of the above strategy from animal rights activists. Um, you know, activists in California have caused a number of cities to ban the sale of fur in their in their cities. Los Angeles recently adopted a, a regulation uh, that that so you know fur years companies that sell fur uh, are prohibited from the city. So the, you know so that's trying to attack from the the business side the the you know the consumption side. So now we're talking about the production side. Just coming out right out right saying that you're going to ban it. Look trapping is a valuable uh, wildlife management tool for a lot of species. And I suspect that California will end up doing, much like they did when they banned mountain lion hunting and trapping in the state, quietly they're going to issue a whole heck of a lot of permits for depredation. So there's going to be animals that are going to be caught and killed in traps. Uh, the difference is... Uh, Government trappers will probably be the ones doing it. Um, you're probably going to see some of those population-dependent diseases that, that show up from time to time, especially when fur prices are low and people aren't taking a lot of, a lot of fur, like distemper, rabies, uh, things like that start showing up in the raccoon populations. Um, you know, one of the natural things when we see large populations of canines is is you see mange show up in that all of those diseases work really well to decimate a population and get it back to carrying capacity but it's a pretty horrendous way to see an animal die so i know folks think that trapping is cruel and, and inhumane uh, the people that are pushing for these things but watch an animal freeze to death from the mange because they have no fur and their body is one big scab, or wander around, you know, aimlessly uh, with rabies or distemper and become a a hazard, you know, for for domestic animals. Um, you know, in the meantime, maybe they'll eat up all the feral cats, and that'll be a temporary boon. Uh, but I. It, while trapping isn't the economic driver that it once was, and let's face it, you know. Trapping is one of the reasons the West was first discovered and settled by Europeans is for the, you know, to, to capture furs and to bring those furs back to Eastern markets. Um, it's still a useful part of our management system for, for wildlife. And these kinds of political based moves, um, I think, we're, you know, we're likely to see more of it in the future than less. And of course, it's coming from California because all the dumb ideas seem to come from there. Zinger, I think you've got something to say about this. Well, I wonder, you know, that they mentioned 5,000 animals were trapped last year. I wonder, first of all, why this is a big deal other than that it's a theme, you know, for any animal consumption is bad for the animal rights activists. Um, but what I wonder is, you know, I feel like in 10 years we're going to look back at, like, our plastics and polyester consumption and we're going to say, you know, trapping was a natural resource. Furs and hides and leather are a renewable resource. And we've created all this plastic and dumped it in the mines or in the uh, dumps of the world. And now we're dealing with it. And I wonder if we're going to look back and say, man, maybe we should have just kept wearing fur and leather all along. And, and ask ourselves if we had it right in this generation as we, you know, fill landfills fills full of plastic, everything, and we wear our clothing twice and throw it out that we bought it forever 21. I don't know. I just, I just think the whole disposable movement that's kind of been part of certainly my generation um, and the last 30 years, definitely, uh, is something we're going to look back on in generations to come and regret. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if, you know, something like trapping wasn't thought to be a good thing again at some point down the road. Um, on top of that, I think it's fun, and my kids are interested in it. So it just it's 
it's culturally something I would hate to see go away. And it seems like California is willing to just dispense of those old ways and in favor of, you know, an urban and different lifestyle than the one that, it, that is the reason they're even a state to begin with. So what do you think, Andrew? I, I agree with you about the cultural sort of legacy, but also um, I don't want to say cultural imperative because that didn't mean anything. But I think there is a lot that explains how we settled the West and really all of America to be explained through, you know, our exploitation in a lot of cases of early trappers and, and working their way up waterways and, and probing into new country. But I guess my take on it is a little more personal. Trapping is, trapping's damned hard. Um, yes. You know, to be effective at it, you've got to be out there all the time in pretty miserable conditions, but it's also hard because it's, um, there are, you really have to understand the animals, uh, and understand their seasonal use of, of things. I, I trap muskrats and beavers, mostly muskrats when I was a little kid. And now I try to trap beaver when I can. Um, I, I've actually given up, given it up because it's so hard and I don't have the time it requires to continually work my trap line. I guess that's what I hate to see go is that people, the trappers who are doing it right and doing it at a high level really have a lot to teach the rest of us in terms of appreciation of the resource. Um, it's by no means an exploitation of the resource anymore, but I mean, they're, they're people who are working the land at a really high level. And I just hate to see that knowledge go away because somebody's determined that it's not in society's best interest to have that anymore. Yeah, I don't know what the rules are in California and it's, I have not had a trapping license for several years. It's been a while since I I've trapped and it's largely, I live in the city and I don't have the time, the ability to get out there. But in, in, when I was trapping any dry land set, you had to check every 24 hours and any water set you had to check every 48 hours. Uh, the thought being that, you know, an animal shouldn't have to wait forever in a, in a foothold trap. Um, on land, you know, water set, they, they drown. So the, the, the death comes fairly quickly. Um, I don't know what the rules are there. I, I just wonder, you know, kind of what, what's the end game? Um, you know, you see people protesting the treatment of, of sheep for producing wool. I mean, these natural fibers that humans have been using for millennia, uh, just seems like this, this recent, hostility towards the gathering of natural fibers it's a luxury that mo the modern world has that no no nowhere in history have we had the, that luxury before where you could say well we're we're going to choose not to trap animals for their skins because well if you need leather you can buy it from the factory farm cows that go into leather and if you need wool well we'll just you know just we buy it at the store never mind the fact that sheep or sheared to provide that fiber uh there's a disconnect and it's it's a luxury of of modern society that we don't need to collect traps to stay warm in the winter but it's the you know the remnants of of that culture and lifestyle i think are important to us culturally but that's that's me as the old romantic talking i guess <laughs> i do think there is something to take away from this though when when we no longer can sustain economically what we do, it makes us very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the great, um, I guess, successes, but also um, the sources of pride that we as hunters talk about all the time is that we, we sustain ourselves economically. We pay licenses to sustain ourselves and the resources that are managed on our behalf. When we lose that, we're pretty vulnerable. Yeah. That's California showing us. Well, you know, related to that, it's funny. I was at the North American Wildlife Conference recently, and I was talking to a person who works for uh, British Columbia, the, the wildlife uh, ministry in British Columbia. And we talked about bears, and they were a little surprised that we everyone at our table knew about British Columbia bear hunting getting banned. Um, you know, they didn't realize that it, it – had ripples all through the country and we had people from all over the United States sitting at the table too. But the interesting thing that that person told me was that 
the fees from bear hunting don't go into a dedicated account in British Columbia, mm-hmm. that it goes into the general treasury, and that all of the funds that are used to run the, the wildlife ministry, and she said this was true in most of Canada, uh, come as general appropriations from the parliament, not a dedicated source of funding the way that we have in the United States. Whereas, you know, license fees from trapping in California or anywhere in the U.S. goes into a game and fish fund of whatever sort in the States, and it can only be used for wildlife management. That wasn't the case in Canada, which that helps make the economic argument that bear hunting wasn't directly contributing to managing resources in British Columbia, so banning it didn't have much of an economic impact. So I think that that's a that's a good case to be made that trappers are a small subset of our overall hunter gatherer population. It's a good example of what happens if you're viewed as small enough to be able to be irrelevant in a legislative setting. And now and and a reminder, at least at the time we're recording this podcast, that proposal has not passed. Trapping is not done in California yet. That's right. But it, I mean, it's all but done, though. I mean, I think they're down to what? What did the article say, Andrew? Under fifteen hundred trapping licenses issued last year. I mean, in a state with thirty-five million people, I mean, fifteen hundred is pretty dang small. I mean, and and the, what they're using is it's culturally irrelevant financially irrelevant, a financial loss, like Andrew said. And it, I think you're right. It's almost a canary in the coal mine for us as hunters where, you know, when we get down into the three, two, three, four percent of the total population of the U.S. is buying hunting licenses. Is this just a, is this just foretelling the, the thing that's going to happen to the rest of the ways that we pursue wild game? I think there's another morality tale in here. And, and I, I'm, I'll throw this out as a trial balloon, but, you know, trapping is vulnerable everywhere. You know, we got some uh, blowback just uh, in the context of this podcast for our discussion of, you know, maybe it's time to revisit uh, coyote hunting contests. And some people legitimately said, whoa, 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 whoa. If that's the first brick that goes, how about um, preserve bird hunts? How about... uh, you know, kind of the next things on down the down the list, the domino effect. And one of the things that worries me about trapping in California with those small numbers of participants is there aren't a whole lot of people also flocking to the defense of that to say, as go trappers, so go the rest of us. They're willing to say trapping is different and it is um, it is an archaic throwback and it's cruel and all the other adjectives that you use for it. I'm not the sort of person who says, you know, stand you know, united we stand, divided we fall on everything. I'm a little bit more nuanced than that, but this is a case where we better watch what happens with trapping because everything else that we do may closely follow. So it's probably time to rise to the defense of the California trapper. I think you're right. I agree. And I think so. Let's do it. it Yeah. So on gravel. Firmly stands behind the trappers of California. Don't ban trapping. We need a we need a chant for our rally. Let us trap. Let us trap. We bear fur. We bear fur. I mean, I'm Maybe working. We say we're, hey, we're fur it. Not again. We're fur it. Yep. <laughs> we're yep, fur it. We're it. Mm-hmm. Well, could we switch gears a little bit and talk about another kind of cultural artifact? Yes. So Dinger and I have had this conversation for a couple of years now. Um, and that is, I guess, distilled to its essence is the things we carry. Um, I'd be really curious to pick your brains about things that are that you cherish that came down through your family and now reside with you that have some field relevance. So I fully expect Dinger to talk about a knife or two. Um, I've got my dad's, a couple of my dad's rifles. Um, Bronson, I'd kind of be curious to know what has been passed down through the years, whether you take it out in the field every time you go or whether it's just something that resonates when you do. First part of the question. The second one is, assuming that you're sort of a station along the way, what do you pass down? 
to your kids. Dinger, what do you got? So my answer to this, Andrew, you're right, is probably a couple of knives that were my paternal and maternal grandfathers. But I will share that I have my eye on uh, a couple of shotguns as well. Um, my first shotgun was a Winchester 1300, and my dad's was the same. And his dad had a Model 12, and all three of those – well, mine is in my gun case but or gun cabinet, but uh, the other two are in my dad's, and so I've got my grubby eyes on those. I think I may have mentioned to our listener previously that I'm foregoing all other forms of inheritance, should there be any, uh, so that I can pick those two guns first so that my son and I and my dad and my – paternal grandfather shotguns can be displayed somewhere someday. So I think uh, we're all as hunters or many of us are a little nostalgia about the way we came up as hunters. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all to know that our listener had uh, each of you or individually, one of you has something really important, probably uh, not far from your line of sight right now that matters to you that came down a generation or two before you. So I don't know. I Things like taxidermy and old traps or old knives remind us of the people that once carried them or once used them. And that's why I keep them. And that's why I'm saving little heirlooms here and there to give to my son. And I imagine it's the same for you. Is that true, Bronson? Yeah, there's, you know, well, I'm a pack rat. I don't like to admit it, but I've got little collections of things that, you know, I keep and my kid is a pack rat and, um, the difference between him and I is you see all of his stuff because it's all over the house. And, you know, mine are in boxes and things in my hunting room. Uh, but the there's a couple things that have been passed down to to me. My no, my dad's still with me, so you know after he's gone, I'm sure my list will grow immensely because he's got a a gun safe full of rifles uh, that I certainly have my eyes on. But uh, my grandfather, my dad's dad died uh nine months to the day before i was born exactly nine months he died on november 4th 1972 i was born uh nine months later um i have now given up my birthday so people can clone me and 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 you know steal my identity but uh he the the day he died he'd been out duck hunting that morning with my dad and he had a winchester model 59 which is not a particularly grand shotgun or or expensive shotgun. It was a two and three quarter inch action. And what, what probably makes it most notable is their wind light. It has a fiberglass barrel with a steel sleeve on the inside. So the front, the barrel is really, really light and I don't shoot it well, but um, I have, I have inherited that shotgun and it's in my gun safe and, I have killed a rough grouse with it, and I'll probably never kill anything else with it because I can't shoot modern duck loads in it with the two and three quarter inch action, and and you know I'm a little worried about the barrel being able to handle pressures of modern loads, um, but it certainly can handle light trap loads, and that's what I use to kill a a, a grouse with it. So I've got that. Um, you know, my dad's got his first deer rifle, which was the Stevens thirty thirty, that. Um, I despise 3030s. I think it's a caliber that whose time has come. Uh, there's so many better calibers out there, but I I suspect I will inherit that and at some point. I probably will take it out, take a deer with it, just to carry on tradition and and then put it in the safe. Um, and then uh, you know, our family, you know, when you, when you when you're old enough to hunt a deer, you get a buck 110 folding pocket knife or not pocket knife, you put it on the sheath on your on your hip. I have already got my son's 110 purchased. It's in, in the closet. And this fall when he's ready to hunt deer, he will get his buck 110 and uh, carry on the tradition of, of Bronson's carrying buck knives. So CJ Buck, I know he's a big listener of our of our podcast. There you go. Send some of that sponsorship money if you got it. <laughs> so... Our listener may have heard Scout barking. It's because I was just hanging on to it. No, it's, I think it's because the water guy's here at the office, and he does not like the waterman's cart, or she doesn't like the waterman's cart. But I was holding on to a very old trap, Andrew, you've seen in my office, that my mentor said that he rescued that had grown oh, into yeah. a tree in Alaska. It's a Oneida Newhouse four-and-a-half trap. He said it's a wolf trap. 
Andrew, do you know anything about that? I think that's something I'd probably keep for, I don't know, till I'm long dead. He said he found it, and it was grown into a tree. It's got that old grappling hook on the end, like a treble-looking hook. Remember seeing that? I, you know, I, I, I think it is a wolf trap. It's certainly is the it? right size. I, I would, I'd love to know, you know, if it was thrown over a limb and the tree grew around it, or if it was a set that the tree grew, you know, grew into. Yeah, um, he said that like, raises was, more questions than it answers. Yeah, he said that the uh, hook was like part of the tree, and he cut this little you know, 10 year old tree down to pull the hook out of it. And there was a wolf inside the tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a wolf yeah. inside the tree, inside the trap hooked with a grappling hook and 10 years of root growth. No, I no no wolf that I know of, but he brought this trap back and it was hanging in his shop and he said that he didn't have any use for it. And I was like, well, I'll keep that thing. That's pretty cool. So that's an example. What are you keeping Andrew? Well, I want to return to guns for a second, but I have, uh, my dad had two pocket knives. They were both case, uh, three bladed stockmans. And, uh, one went to my brother. I hope when my dad died in 2009 and we, we, all of us kids kind of split up things that we really cared about. Um, I've got a brown stockman, case stockman that's got, uh, the sheep foot blade is busted off. So if it's hunting season, that's in my pocket. And I fully intend to pass that down to one of my kids. Here's the the artifact that got away, though, and I'm still kind of grieving this one. So my dad spent a lot of his time with his grandfather out in Isabel, South Dakota, West River, out in the prairie west of Mobridge. And we we spent some time out there after he died. The summer after he died, we took some of his ashes out to the old family ranch and uh, spread them out there. We, we went through a lot of old family photos. I remember seeing a series of photos of my dad as a little kid holding a handful of crows in one hand and holding the barrel of a double action or a double barreled shotgun in the other with the butt on the ground. I, I digitized that photo and I, I zoomed up on it and it was a, I don't know who made that shotgun, but it had two exposed hammers. And the thing was about, must've had 32 inch barrels, uh, just long old blunderbuss of a gun. And I remember my dad talking about just how, what a mule that thing was to kick. Um, anyway, there's pictures of my dad with, there were some pheasants, but mostly the crow pictures, what I remembered when we were back in Isabel spreading those, um, ashes, we got invited to the guy who ended up buying the family ranch, his house for supper. And I was talking to him about this gun and he goes downstairs. He's like, Oh, you mean this one? Oh, and no way. Guy, yeah, the guy had that old uh, exposed barrel shotgun, and uh, I mean, I, I I wanted to appeal to his you know better nature and sense of history and ethnography and everything. He would not part with that shotgun. So it, it's just one of those. I I it was just something to just cherish for the few minutes I held it in my hands and kind of imagined it. So that gun had passed down from my great grandfather to my grandfather to my dad. And apparently the lineage has stopped there. Um, someday I'll go back and try to make another pitch to get it back in the family. But uh, it almost hurts worse when it's not in the family, but you know, it's out there. Man, that's cool. I remember going to my grandpa's farm auction when they were selling his guns. I was pretty young. I had just started a business. I didn't have any money. And to your point, I know who bought all of his guns from the auction and they were going for two and three and $400, just, you know, an amount of money that today as a little older person, you'd just, you'd just do it and just buy them all or at least many of them. And you're right. It's painful to know that they're out there that you had a chance at them, whatever small chance it was and that you let it go. I agree with you. Yeah. So I do have a picture a of one of my boys. Yeah, I have a picture of one of my boys with that holding that gun with a coonskin cap on. So that's uh, maybe we'll post that on the on the Facebook page. It's a cool photo. Anyway, sorry. See, I had a shotgun when I was a teenager that my dad had bought. My dad had never owned. My dad, blue collar, worked in factory. Had never owned an over and under shotgun. Really wanted one. Bought a Beretta six eighty six, and could not shoot it for the life of him. It was too light or whatever. 
and and I was a teenager, and he and I were waist deep in a in a pond one day, and he was just tired of missing. And I had my old uh, eight seventy Express that I was carrying, and so he handed me the the over and under, and he said, "Here, you shoot this." And I went and I proceeded to shoot two doubles in a row with my first, you know, first four shots out of the shotgun ever. So I immediately felt an attachment to the shotgun. And I told my dad I had an attachment to the shotgun and he kind of offhandedly said, well, maybe for your graduation. Well, I graduated from college two years later and uh, he had sold that shotgun to his brother. So he didn't have it. And so I graduated and, you know, I got a pat on the back and, you know, a car uh, <laughs> payment taken care of. So that was good. So fast forward, you know, four or five years, I'm out of college. I'm, I'm working my first job and I'm hunting geese with my uncle and my uncle is carrying that shotgun. And I'm sitting there kind of looking at it. I've got a little bit of money in my pocket and I'm like, man, I should make him an offer. And uh, my uncle ended up selling me that shotgun for a couple hundred bucks. I mean, it was it was a sweetheart deal of a sweetheart deal. So I have returned that shotgun into my possession, and that's my my go to upland gun when I'm hiking the prairies for miles after miles. And uh, since my dad is a listener, it's no thanks to you, old man. So, uh, <laughs> so, but. By a listener, you mean the listener? The listener. But uh, please don't don't sell off your other guns before you know I can get my hands on them. So, so anyway, that that story might backfire on me. Again, I think this is a listener participation segment. We would love to hear uh, heirlooms that you carry and intend to pass down. So I'll leave us posts on Facebook page. I will try to post that picture of my kid to kind of spark the discussion. That'd be cool. Well, we can't leave today without returning to our dichotomous question. So I'm going to put it out to you. You've had a little time to think about it, so I expect the answers to be well reasoned and persuasive. Wheat or or corn tortillas? Wheat. Wheat. Damn it. Well, I guess I'll have to go corn just to be the contrarian. <laughs> I mean, come on, they're originally corns. Corn ground is called maize. It, you know, if trapping settled North America, maize settled South America. It's got to be maize. Mm. You don't even people. believe that. God, God I love flour tortillas. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. I, you know, they have gluten in them, so J.J. Wright can't eat them, but, uh, man, I love flour tortillas. Mm -hmm. we, we, we tried to have tacos recently, and my wife accidentally bought corn tortillas. And I, I could, I, I turned it into a taco salad. I couldn't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even believe it. That was the lamest dichotomous question ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, if your dog was a person, a well-known person, who would they be? Che Guevara. Jeez. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> so your your dog's a commie murderer who is responsible for the killings of millions of Central and South American uh, uh, people. I mean, seriously, that's my, who you're going with. I got my reasons. Okay, <laughs> what are they? <laughs> How about you, Bronson? Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> my dog has invented the entire the, the the whole the founding of of gonzo fetching you heard of gonzo God. journalism gonzo fetching fear and loathing bumpers <laughs> yes mm -hmm. well seriously have you it, my dog drinks a lot i mean it's water but if <laughs> if she had access to gin it would be gin Dare? actually a little well, well, hold on. Before Eric weighs in on this, I have to give you just one interlude of the weekend. This is another thing. And and maybe you're channeling a little bit of uh, Hunter S. Thompson my way. So uh, I take my visitors down to the calf uh, barn to see a couple calves being born. And Nellie goes with us trying to keep Nellie away from the cows because she just agitates them so much. All work so we're walking back up the hill toward our homestead from the cow operation. And Nellie is actually, to Dinger's point about our consumable society, Nellie is really good at picking up trash. 
she'll find a plastic bag or a, a McDonald's cup or something and just fetch it and bring it to me on any time we're out. So she finds this little piece of plastic and brings to me, well, it's a little plastic bag. And I congratulate her for, you know, keeping the farmscape clean. Uh, and she's just carrying it around. All of a sudden she drops it on a snow drift, out pops a white and blue pill. Oh, like a capsule. And before I can stop her, she gobbles it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was kind of, I was on Nelly watch all night. Like what's going to happen here? I don't know what it was like a upper or downer. I don't know. I don't know what they've been taking at the calf barn. Well, and she's, that's she's a, not a male. So the erection couldn't last more than four hours. <laughs> but that's a Hunter S. Thompson move if I ever saw one. Uh, I have a buddy that that reminds me of. We, yeah. we call him intake. If there's a, if there's anything, <laughs> Anything to be eaten, drank, consumed, any any sort of stimulant or depressant around whatsoever. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll take one. Yeah, I'll do that. Sure. Yeah. Let's have another one. So he's we're worried how long he's going to live, but intake is a well-earned name for him. So apparently Nelly might be part of intake stock. Maybe so. Anyway, I interrupt you for that interlude. What are you thinking? I just said interlude. <laughs> <laughs> Boobies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I said erection, but I did it clinically. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that Scout reminds me of, like, she's a red dog, so I have to pick a redheaded character from somewhere and so i'm gonna say orphan annie because she is so like she's tiny she's soft like you can't you have to like positive her into doing things like, if you yell at her she'll just cower in the corner and hide like she doesn't have any of what nelly has where she's like oh you're not looking let me go destroy this thing over here she's like oh you're looking i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> so it's a hard knock life yes. for us. She's it's just a hard knock it's like life she's been raised us. by just evil, like abusive, you know, characters. And so just anybody to love her, like if she'll just like I don't know, she's just such a soft, like I don't know. You can offend her if you so you're her wrong, Yes. You can offend her by looking at her wrong. She's not much of a singer though. Oh, I've heard her sing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're the yeah. if you're the guy yeah, that we, brings we all heard her sing. If you're the guy that brings water to Powder Hook, you would think she could sing. Man, she does not like that guy. He brings a water cart full of like those three gallon water jugs for our water, and uh, she does not like his cart at all. <laughs> In fact, he, he thought it was her, and then he set down the cart, and then looked at her sternly, and she cowered at him, but barked at the at the cart. <laughs> oh, what a wimp! <laughs> A wimpy dog. I, I know we're running long. I know we're running long, but I got one more dog story related to this. So, so my last dog, Delta, I went hunting for the first time with uh, Bob St. Pierre from, from Pheasants Forever, another sister podcast on the wing uh, where they talk about pheasants all the time. Uh, but he and I were hunting, and his his dog was named Trammel. He's from Michigan, and he was a Tigers fan, and Alan Trammel is – you know, the famous shortstop that he named his dog after. And I I was a baseball fan in that era. And I remember that the second baseman on that team, the 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 the, the famous one, you know, uh six four double play combo was sweet Lou Whitaker. And so Bob introduces me to his dog and he asked me what my dog's name was, and I said, Lou. And he's like, Really? And I said, Yeah, I named him after Sweet Lou Whitaker. And he says well, why did you do that? And I said, well, you know, I'm just kind of a fan. And 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 he says, is it because she's black? And he didn't <laughs> even realize that, you know, what he said was kind of, you know, offensive. But he, he meant it in all due kindness. He thought it was pretty cool that we had this one-two combo. And then it broke his heart when I told him my dog's name was actually Delta. <laughs> Named after a competing nonprofit organization. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hunted with Don Young, the old CEO of Ducks Unlimited, one time, and he was really upset with the name of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Dale Hall never seemed to care. I'm done well, name dropping. 
<laughs> With that, uh, I hope the snow is melting wherever you are. I hope the mosquito season's still many, many weeks away. And I get to go to the very first track practice of the new year today. All right. Go yell at some people. So I'm gonna go I'm gonna go yell at those slackers, those laggards, mm-hmm. and hope nobody frostbites. Did you even before. frostbite your hands over the winter? <laughs> <laughs> so until next time, won't you won't you please? Can't you won't you keep it on gravel?